I would like to start by asking you a question. How do you answer to the question, where are you from? Do you find that an easy question? Or do you think about the follow-up question, which could be, where are you really from? Now, if you have a migration background, or if you have a mixed background, then the where are you really from question, you may have heard it more than you can remember. Now, my father, on the right, um, was Japanese. He moved to Belgium as a karate teacher in the 1960s. My Belgian mom was his student, and they fell in love, and they made two beautiful children. <laughs> and my sister and I were born and raised in Brussels, in Belgium, where at home we spoke Dutch, French, Japanese, and then my parents, they had a secret language. <laughs> they spoke English. <laughs> now, I had a happy and carefree childhood. Um, I had lots of friends in Belgium, and I went to school there. And whenever we had the chance, we would visit Japan to see relatives and even more friends. And I feel that wherever I was, I was always just one of the kids. I was really lucky because I had two places that I could call my home. Now, something changed in 1986. Belgium was doing really well at the World Cup football. They were eliminated by Argentina in the semi-finals. And of course, we reenacted those matches at school. And everybody could be anybody. My friends could be any Belgian star player. They could even be Diego, Armando, Maradona. <laughs> but not me. I had to be Japan. And back in 1986, Japan did not participate in the World Cup. They did not even have a professional football league. So being Japan in football at that time really was not that cool. At the same time, I learned that my Japanese family referred to me as the gaijin, which means the foreigner. Now with that, for the first time I realized that I was not in control of my identity. Who I am is also determined, determined by how other people see me. Now in the years that followed, I would learn to navigate between cultures and expectations that people have of me. And however hard I tried, in Belgium, I was never one of the Belgians. And in Japan, I was never Japanese enough. And all I wanted was to be accepted. But the lack of acceptation made me insecure. And I think this is what we call the imposter syndrome. Now, let's fast forward to 2016. It's about 30 years after the World Cup that I just mentioned. I was living in Amsterdam. And this one was just born, my first daughter. And questions that I had about my identity were suddenly relevant for her. Who is she going to be? It was also the time that I decided to become a professional photographer. And when my mentors asked me to work on a personal project, I decided to go and photograph people who, just like me, have one Japanese parent. In Japan, we are often, often referred to as hafu. Now, hafu comes from the English word half, like half Japanese, half Belgian. But it's without the negative connotation of half blood or half caste. And being hafu does not mean you're not complete or not whole. It just means half something, half another country. And the first person I photographed was a friend I knew from Kendo which is a typical Japanese martial art. And I prepared some questions, and I went to his house, and I interviewed him, and we took a photo. And when I went home, I wrote a short story, a human interest type of story. But I wasn't happy with the result. What I had written was something that you forget about 
while you're still reading it. So that's it didn't stick. And over the days that followed, I kept thinking about a question that he had asked me. Because I had asked him to give me one question that I could then take to the next person so that we would have more interesting topics to talk about. And his question to me was, have you ever wanted to look less or more Japanese? Now that question kept running through my head and I decided to replace the bad story by this single question. And then I went back because I thought the photo wasn't great either to take another version of my friend's photo. And with this, I had one photo, I had one question, and I had my format. I also had a name for my project, which is Hafu to Hafu, from one Hafu to another Hafu. This format, I always use the same pattern. So I would interview somebody for one hour, and we would talk about anything. And it worked like a pressure cooker. And at the end of the hour, we would boil it down, the conversation, to one single open question, like the one you just saw. And we would go outside and take the photo. And I asked my participants to stand about this close. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and I asked them to look straight into the camera at me and think of their question and the feeling it evokes. This format, one photo, one question, allows me to address sensitive topics while still staying away from personal anecdotes that people do not always want to talk about with a wider audience. And having one question creates interaction with the viewer, with you. And because there are no answers, you have to look within yourself to find the answers. And which question you like says more about you than about the person in the photo. Now that, for me, was a format that sticks. So over the weeks that followed, I photo photographed about 12 people. And I could have stopped right there. It was a hobby project, it was informal. But just to see what would happen, I decided to share the photos online. And I stumbled upon an interesting phenomenon. I found Facebook groups with thousands of half Japanese people. Now, I don't know about Spain, but there are no Facebook groups for half Belgian people. And I asked the community to comment on my photos. And what happened was pretty, I think, amazing. I got answers from all over the world, day and night. And I was invited by one of the founders of one of these Facebook groups to go to Los Angeles to present the project at a festival for people with back Japanese backgrounds. And this is where I realized that my photo project had a huge blind spot. Because I met people from every corner of the world. But all the people in my project looked like me. They had one Japanese parent and one white parent. Now, that was not a correct representation of the diversity within the Hafu community. So we did what we do. We go to a karaoke bar, <laughs> and we drink a lot. <laughs> and after way too many drinks, I had a solution. What if I could photograph a Hafu Japanese person with a non-Japanese parent from as many countries as possible? Something like this. Now, the next day, at breakfast, hungover, we looked up how many countries there are. And according to the United Nations, there are 192 possible combinations. Now, I wasn't sure how I was going to tell my wife that what was supposed to be the end of a hobby project became the start of a new adventure. Over the time that followed, I built a website, and I asked the community to help me find participants. And slowly, the map started to turn green. And over four years or so, I photographed 150 half-Japanese people with a non-Japanese parent from 102 different countries.
Now I know I'm not at my end goal yet, but I think that I have a pretty good representation now of the diversity within the half a Japanese community. And this diversity has also allowed me to pinpoint some of the factors that determine how we experience our half -ness. For example, it makes a difference if you are born and raised inside or outside of Japan. It makes a difference if you are close to 80, like this man, or if you are eight, like this boy. And it makes a difference if you have one Japanese father or a Japanese mother. And it makes a difference if you speak, read and write Japanese well or not. And it makes a difference if you visit Japan a lot or the other country. And it makes a difference if you have a Japanese name, like me, Miyazaki Tetsuro. Or if you're called John Smith. That makes a difference. Another thing that makes a difference is the other country. And subsequently, your cultural background and unfortunately, your ethnic background make a difference. Now, having photographed so many people from so many places, and I've made so, much, so many friends that I could never have made if it wasn't for my identity crisis, my search for answers. And doing this project, I often thought, I'm taking too much of these people. I'm taking the time, I'm taking their stories, and I'm literally taking their pictures for my personal benefit. But I was happy to hear that many of the people enjoyed our conversations, and that they shared their photos and questions online, and that some used the photo project to talk about identity-related issues with their parents, with whom they could never talk about this if it wasn't for the project. Now, the project has become a book, back when I, would, when, when I had hair. <laughs> and I've held exhibitions in Japan and in Europe and in the United States, and I've held workshops around identity in museums, universities, community centers. And I've held picnics and meetups for half Japanese people to meet each other and to be part of a community. And it has given me a voice as a photographer. But even after all this time, I still find it hard to answer the where are you really from question. I have accepted that I have a complex identity. And I don't blame people for not understanding who I am if even I find it hard to give a simple answer. But the main thing that changed is that I stopped asking or that I stopped trying to be what I think other people want me to be. Thank you. <laughs>